After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991, Russia went on the course of economic reforms known as the Russian Shock Therapy. While the chaotic transformation caused most Russians to lose all of their savings in just a few weeks, a group of ruthless businessmen managed to buy up state assets in rig auctions and became some of the most powerful people on earth. And the Russian oligarchs were born. But today, we're not just talking about any oligarchs. You see, there are two main categories of Russian oligarchs. The first one is former Soviet politicians that were the members of the communist elite. They were able to use their power and political connections to gain ownership of Russia's most valuable assets. But the second one is much more interesting. These are a group of young businessmen who were born extremely poor and were on the margins of society. They grew up to become underground like marketeers in which they honed their business skills. Some were even imprisoned or served in labor camps for economic crimes. During the perestroika reform enacted by President Gorbachev and the privatization of Russian assets, they were able to use their skills and ruthlessness gained from years of black market experience. And by exploiting Russia's chaotic economic conditions, they became some of the world's richest people. Not only does this make for a good Rex to riches story riddled with corruption, collusion, and mafia-style business tactics, but we can also learn a lot about the economic conditions during the Soviet and Russian era. Let's get into it. Okay, so to understand how people of such humble, even despised origins were able to acquire massive wealth so quickly, it is necessary to look at the Soviet economic situations in the 1970s and 80s. During this period, all kinds of private business activity were prohibited, and those who violate the law can be charged with an economic crime, with the most severe punishment being death. But the Soviet underground economy was huge. The annual transaction value was around $145 billion, and 20 million people were estimated to work either full-time or part-time in the Soviet black market. So despite the huge risk, there were still a lot of people willing to bear that risk. And under Leonid Brezhnev's leadership, enforcement of laws was not as severe as during Stalin's rule. So that kinda helped. Most of the people involved in these illegal endeavors were members of non-Russian ethnic groups who were marginalized and excluded from various opportunities, like these future oligarchs. For example, one of the oligarchs was denied entrance to a top college because he's a Jew. So these ambitious men set up underground businesses as their first step towards achieving money and power. Okay, so what kinds of products or services do they sell or perform? Well, almost everything was available in the black market. One very popular item during this era was blue jeans legally imported from America. Besides that, daily necessities like food were also frequently traded. One of the oligarchs, for example, was printing and selling Bibles to make ends meet. And the soon-to-be oligarchs were doing things like trading foreign currencies, reselling theater tickets, all the way to washing windows. Truly humble beginnings. This all changed in 1987, when President Mikhail Gorbachev decided to allow the operations of cooperative and private businesses. It was the first time Soviets could open and do business legally since the 1920s. Suddenly, these marginalized people, including many Jewish people, found themselves with skills and knowledge that gave them a huge competitive advantage. And in no time, they began to set up businesses and put their skills to good use. One of the oligarchs, for example, was working in construction. And due to years of black market experience, he had a knack for finding suppliers in a period when there were no readily available supplies for things like lumbers and nails. He established a legal cooperative, which was just an undercover for the black market operations he was running. He used the profits to later build a bank for himself. Another oligarch built a cooperative that produces women's clothes. Because state planners regarded pantyhoses as too unimportant to produce, he was able to rack up huge profits, catering to the extremely unsatisfied demand for pantyhoses. And another oligarch ran a children's toy manufacturer, where he produced plastic ducks from his apartment. Virtually all of the future oligarchs built businesses right after it was allowed by President Gorbachev. But there are various ways people could make money during this period. When Gorbachev allowed the operations of private businesses, he initially did so with limits because he was afraid that the state sector would be unable to compete and create chaos in the country. So at first, only students and pensioners were allowed to do business. 
the decision to retain centrally fixed prices in state stores while allowing only partial freedom of entry for private businesses generated great opportunities for arbitrage, aka when you buy goods in a market with low prices and then sell them at high prices in another market, profiting from market inefficiencies. And there were major imbalances between prices set by the state and market prices. So there were lots of money to be made by selling state manufactured products and reselling them at higher prices that private sellers could charge. This was often done illegally through backdoor operations. The combination of limited entry, shortages, and weak laws also caught the attention of the mafia, who were quick to enter the market and gain control of various businesses, either through coercion, bribery, or collusion with senior management. Some of the oligarchs also took assets by force as the mafia did. They used aggressive takeover tactics, manipulated regional legislatures and judges, and took advantage of existing weak laws. Often, they behave more like gangsters, using violence to take advantage of the weak, and their influences were especially strong in certain provinces where bureaucrats and judges were paid poorly, which became a breeding ground for corruption. Mikhail Khodorkovsky, who at one time was the richest person in Russia, said, At the time, Russian laws allowed us to do things that were unthinkable in the Western business world. When the Soviet Union fell in December 1991, these methods were intensified and many of the future oligarchs were making good money. But they were by no means billionaires. You don't become overnight billionaires by dealing in a black market or profiting from arbitrage. The real money was made when Russia began moving on from communism and privatized its companies. You see, Russia was and still is a country blessed with natural resources. The country had tons of oil, natural gas, diamonds, and metal ore, all of them highly coveted commodities. And from the perspective of the future oligarchs, these assets were great for stealing. It doesn't matter whether the underlying company is profitable or not, or whether you have a clue about the business that you own. You can still sell the company assets and make huge fortunes from them. Privatization in Russia occurred rapidly and with great speed, as the government at the time was afraid that communism would came back. But the chaotic implementation of it brought many opportunities for corrupt dealings. For former Soviet politicians who understood the game, they were able to arrange sweet dealings where they would become the managing directors of Russia's natural resources companies. Even when the state still owns the majority of the share, weak loss means that these directors can easily strip the company assets and sell them to another company that they themselves own at their cheap prices. And then they sold those assets to the open market at far higher prices, making huge profits for themselves while the country sustained all of the losses. And in many cases, they also had ties with regulators that allowed them to prevent foreign buyers from buying shares or maintain monopoly power. For the rags to riches oligarchs that we're examining, the methods are a little bit different. Of course, political connections were still needed as it is the most important determinant of wealth in Russia. But there is one thing that almost all of the oligarchs do, they build a bank. At the time, the capital requirements for opening a bank were around $75,000 to $100,000, so it was pretty affordable. Using the connections they got from earlier business ventures, the oligarchs were able to strike up deals for managing state funds. One oligarch, for example, worked with the mayor of Moscow to manage the city's deposit allowing him to benefit from the float generated by the use of funds held by the city of Moscow. With money on hand, these banks could use it to speculate on the dollar-ruble exchange rate or buy high-yielding government bonds, which at one time had an annual interest rate of over 200%. And the oligarchs also used the banks to underwrite loans to themselves and began collecting state companies while stripping its assets. Russian banks at the time also had ties with the mafia, in 1994, the CIA released a report that stated half of Russia's 25 largest banks were penetrated or even controlled by the mafia. In 1995, the Russian government enacted the Loans for a Share scheme, where the oligarchs lent money to the government using their own banks. As a collateral, the government pledged shares of some of its most valuable state companies. If the government fails to pay the money back, the shares can then be auctioned and the oligarchs get to keep 30% of the profits. The government ended up defaulting on the debt, and to no one's surprise, the oligarchs kept the shares for themselves. 
auctions were carefully rigged so that no competitors were available, and the oligarchs were able to buy some of Russia's most valuable companies at extremely low prices. For example, one oil and gas company held its auction in a remote Siberian location and paid authorities to close down the local airport. Meanwhile, in 1996, the same group of oligarchs helped to fund the political campaign of Boris Yeltsin. These people are known as the Seven Bankers. They pulled money from their banks and began supporting President Yeltsin to win the 1996 re-election. Some of them also own media companies and will provide propaganda. In the end, Yeltsin won the election, and the oligarchs successfully manipulated him and his political environment from behind the scenes. Now, if you enjoyed this video, you should watch this one next, where I truly explain China's property market meltdown and what it means for China and the world going forward. This is Doverhill, and see you next time.